Well, welcome everybody, and thank you to Wendy and Jack and the Melanoma Research Alliance and Grace for having me here today and uh, this opportunity to speak with you. I've been working with oncology patients for about 35 years now, and in the past uh, 15 years, specifically with lung cancer, but a bit of experience with melanoma and with renal cell as well. And for the past several years, working on many trials with immunotherapy with all of those groups. So this is a great opportunity to talk about side effects. So you've heard about the mechanism of action, and you've heard about uh, some of the, the ways that we're going to be administering this therapy, and I'm gonna be talking now about some potential side effects, as we know most therapies have. Um, I do have some disclosures. I do some consulting for uh, the pharmaceutical companies listed here as far as developing patient education materials. So as far as uh, discussing some of the side effects, I will tell you that the most common side effect that most patients on any of the immunotherapies experience is fatigue. So that is the overwhelming arching uh, side effect. Some of the ones that I have listed here, and we're gonna go through each of these systems, are ones that have the potential for causing what we would consider a grade three or grade four toxicity. And it can be a little intimidating to look at this list, but hopefully I'll kind of set your mind at ease when we go through each of these. It's important to mention them because as you, uh, the patients and caregivers will be identifying, uh, you may be experiencing some of these, and it's important for you to be able to relay those uh, symptoms to us so that we can help manage those so that they don't progress to a more significant side effect while you're on therapy. So the first one that we'll talk about is gastrointestinal, and we do see this in the form of either diarrhea, colitis, occasional perforation, and we see that a little bit more frequently in the CTLA-4 patients, so ipilimumab patients. Uh, we'll talk about renal toxicities, um, pulmonary toxicities, dermatologic, uh, hepatic, neurologic, and also um, spend a bit of time on endocrine and also on ocular. Side effects really are variable for this. We're just learning as we go through these trials, and so this list that I have up here is by no means all uh, exclusive. We continue to identify new potential side effects that patients might uh, experience. The average onset is at about six to 12 weeks, and because these side effects occur when your immune system, is, as we're talking about, is being activated and revved up to fight the cancer cells, it also has the potential for uh, causing some irritation and some inflammation to normal healthy tissue. And that's really the basis by uh, how these side effects develop. So again, after your body starts to develop an immune response, at about that six to 12 week period is when you might see some side effects. It doesn't mean that it can occur within a few days after after uh, the administration, and sometimes it can occur after several doses or even long-term after discontinuation of therapy. So we always are uh, alert to any change in side effects that any patients are experiencing and keeping in mind that this might be an immune response. The frequency for grade three or four toxicity, is, however, is very low. I talked about fatigue being the most common side effect across what we call grade one to grade th uh, four toxicity, but really grade three, four toxicity, which are things that require us to have a significant medical intervention, perhaps hospitalization, and perhaps uh, really a little uh, interruption in your therapy and occasionally uh, discontinuation of therapy, um, occurs in less than 10% of patients. So while these sound overwhelming, I don't want you to get nervous because, again, it's a small percentage of patients that do experience the more severe side effects. Some patients with the grade one and two can be asymptomatic, may not even realize that they're having specific uh, inflammatory responses. Uh, there is some suggestion that there is dose dependency, so higher doses may trigger uh, increased uh, side effects. Perhaps there's a cumulative effect after several cycles of therapy. And there's also some suggestion that there might be an additive effect. So for those patients that are being treated perhaps with a CTLA-4 agent as well as an anti-PD-1 agent, there may be an increase in some of those toxicities. But again, this is what we're, we're learning as we go through the trials uh, right now. So we'll start with the gastrointestinal uh, inflammation. Uh, the patterns can be, as I said, really variable. They might just be minor irritations. Patients might develop some colitis, which is an inflammation of the colon, but they might even have some minor uh, inflammation of the esophagus or the stomach, causing some mild nausea, a little bit of stomach irritation, perhaps some cramping. 
Uh, the one that we uh, usually hear about, particularly with the CTLA-4, is diarrhea and a significant increase in diarrhea. And so what we're looking at is a change in patient's normal pattern of behavior. If you're somebody that's used to having one or two loose stools a day, that's not going to be can, uh, go into the classification of diarrhea. But if you've had an increase in your number of stools over six times, four to six times per day, that's certainly something that you need to notify your healthcare provider about. Patients may also have some associated cramping or bloating that goes along with that, and abdominal pain. So if somebody has a significant increase in diarrhea, a significant increase in pain, those are things that you need to immediately call your health care provider about and not wait until your next visit to, to call us. Um, as far as evaluation, as I mentioned, we're going to be calculating the frequency and the number of uh, loose stools that you have. You also might be asked to provide a stool sample because you also are at risk for uh, developing any other opportunistic infections or kind of bacterial infections. Uh, so we want to make sure that you don't have an infectious process going on that's contributing to this, this side effect that you might have. Occasionally, patients will need to have an ultrasound or a CAT scan, uh, again, just to rule out an inflammation of the bowel. A colonoscopy might be required, um, perhaps with a biopsy, to see if there is this inflammatory response going on. Typically, if a patient just has some mild diarrhea, we may just either delay treatment or may not even need to delay treatment. We might just provide supportive care in the form of uh, hydration to assure that you don't get dehydrated. Antispasmodics, if you've got a lot of stomach cramping, uh, you might benefit from something like Bentol, which decreases the stomach spasm and stomach uh, discomfort. Antidiarrheals such as Imodium, which is over the counter, or Lamotil might be prescribed for you to help manage the diarrhea. We do suggest that none of these are just taken independently, that you do certainly keep your healthcare provider informed so that we can assure that we're monitoring it very closely, that it does not progress to a grade three or four toxicity. Occasionally, you might have to have an interruption in therapy, meaning that we hold the immunotherapy for a period of time until your side effect has decreased to a level that you can tolerate and is not going to be um, uh, really escalate to a grade three or grade four. Some patients might require steroids. Now, if it's a mild toxicity, it may be oral steroids in the form of, of prednisone or perhaps dexamethasone, if that's what was se uh, selected for you. And the reason that you're receiving these steroids is to help s suppress that immune response. Patients get nervous thinking that we've just revved up this immune response now to fight the cancer, and now you're going to be suppressing it. We don't have a lot of data at this point to suggest that that's going to inhibit the response that you're going to have from that immunotherapy. We continue to collect that information. But again, just like we talked about having the accelerators and then having the brakes, it's important that we have that balance so that you can safely receive this therapy and go on to have a long-term response. So again, steroids might be uh, prescribed to you. If you have to have IV steroids, you might have to be hospitalized for a brief period of time. And then you'll slowly transition over to an oral steroid until your symptoms have completely resolved. And, ther and therapy may go on to be uh, prescribed again. So it really depends on the patient's uh, symptoms. Occasionally, we have to add some other immunosuppressant agents if uh, the, the diarrhea, the colitis, the cramping is really not resolving uh, completely on its own. So now we're going to move to some endocrine organs. And we've got a few of those to talk about. So the first one is the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is located in your neck, just for if people aren't aware of that. Uh, it does uh, secrete several different uh, hormones that are responsible for influence, uh, influencing metabolism, growth and development, and also temperature regulation. When the thyroid gets inflamed, it can do one of two things. It, it can either be hypoactive, hypothyroidism, meaning that it's not as activated as, as it should have been. And those signs and symptoms that are associated with that can be weight gain, tiredness, uh, dry skin, constipation, or a general feeling of being cold and just not feeling like you have energy to do your daily activities. Again, very, very subtle signs and symptoms. So it's important that you're communicating your baseline activity level and baseline symptoms to your healthcare provider with each visit. And even if you notice some slight changes to let us know. Uh, hyperthyroidism is when your thyroid gland is gonna be hyperactive or it's overactive. Patients may experience weight loss, a rapid heart rate, feeling some palpitations, maybe some nervousness or some irritability. Uh, they also might have some diarrhea or a feeling of, uh, of generalized uh, feeling too warm. So typically, this pattern may develop as initially, there's variable patterns. Patients may develop hyperthyroidism first, then they might stabilize out and then go on to be hyper, uh, hypothyroid. 
uh, the, the management for hypo, uh, hyperthyroidism is really managing the symptoms. If patients have significant palpitations or their heart is racing, nervousness, they might be uh, treated with some medications such as beta blockers, which will help to decrease those palpitations and slow the heart rate down just a little bit. Uh, the evaluation for all of these is going to be by blood tests. So typically when you come in, we'll be monitoring your thyroid function tests, if you hear those words, particularly your thyroid stimulating hormone and T, uh, T3 and T4. So those are some additional blood tests that are not routinely done if you've received standard chemotherapeutic regimens in the, in the past. If you're... Uh, Having some unstable lab work, you might need uh, an endocrine consult to help evaluate and help uh, monitor the status. So that would be typically what you would expect for, for uh, thyroid dysfunction. The pituitary gland is a very active endocrine order, uh, organ. It's located in the, the midpoint of the brain, very small. And typically, uh, patients that have some inflammation, because it's right next to the optic chiasm, like right next to the optic nerve, if there's any inflammation of that pituitary gland, patients will typically complain of maybe a mild headache. They might have some visual changes or some blurred vision. Uh, the pituitary gland is very active in releasing several different hormones. The ones that are listed here, they're, I'm not going to go through individually all of the ones that are listed, um, and they are in your book for your, for your reference. But because it's so important, it does stimulate other endocrine organs, such as the adrenal gland and the thyroid gland. Obviously, if it's inflamed, it could cause a, a significant dysfunction in many of your endocrine uh, 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 functions in your body. So you might have general feelings of fatigue, maybe some insomnia. There might be a, a decrease in uh, sexual drive. There could be a loss of appetite. So again, vague symptoms is typically what we see, not an overwhelming symptoms. Headache is usually the one that's more significant. What we have to worry about when patients have any visual changes, as you know, or any kind of uh, significant headaches is, to, as, as most oncology patients, the first thing you worry about is, oh my goodness, you know, do I have, has this metastasized to my brain and do I need to worry about that? So typically after obtaining blood work with all of the, uh, a variety of the uh, hormone levels from the pituitary, we'll also obtain an MRI of the brain to take a look at that pituitary to see if it is inflamed. And I think that if you can see, Right here, this pituitary should be about the size of this small little darkened area here. So this is an MRI that really just demonstrates the significant inflammation of that pituitary gland, causing a lot of pressure on the optic nerve. And the brain has a fixed cavity. You're going to have headaches and perhaps some other neurologic side effects from that. Um, so again, this is uh, ruling out that the patient has got metastatic disease, but in fact, it does. Uh, there is inflammation of, of the pituitary, and this is called uh, hypophysitis. Uh, for a fancy, fancy word for that. Typically, we hold therapy. We definitely hold therapy, the immunotherapy, for this in this instance. And patients are usually admitted to the hospital for intravenous uh, methylprednisolone. And then again, once they're stabilized and there is a decrease in the size of the pituitary, they can go home to be discharged on oral steroids until all the symptoms are res uh, 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 resolved. Occasionally, patients might need to have some other hormone replacement if there's been any damage to the pituitary. So all of those hormones I listed for the pituitary, you might have to have receive some supplemental hormones uh, more long term. For any patients that are on any of the long term or intravenous uh, uh, steroids for suppression. If you're going to be on them more than a week or perhaps 10 days, you're also going to be prescribed antibiotics because being on the steroids does increase your risk for opportunistic infections. So typically patients will be started on an oral antibiotic like Bactrim three times a week, or if you're allergic to that, it might be an inhaled uh, therapy so to minimize your risk of developing an, uh, what we call an opportunistic infection. So we'll see that across all of the different uh, side effects. The adrenal gland, another uh, gland, it's actually two glands that are on the, on the back end of the, of the kidneys are responsible for the release of several uh, hormones, glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, uh, in terms of the uh, adrenal cortex, and those are listed here, as well as the adrenal medulla hormones, which is epinephrine and norepinephrine. The epinephrine, norepinephrine really are your um, protective mechanisms that the adrenal gland are responsible for. And the adrenal cortex really are the essential hormones that your body needs to function every single day. If there's an inflammation of the adrenal gland, initially starts with the adrenalitis, but if it does progress to more progressive symptoms, it could put you into a risk for what we call an uh, adrenal insufficiency or, or adrenal crisis, which becomes much more significant and, uh, uh, 
requires hospitalization. Again, symptoms vary uh, similar to the other, uh, fatigue, malaise. You might develop a decrease in your blood pressure, so we need to manage that a little bit more. Vague gastrointestinal symptoms. Hypoglycemia might develop a loss of sex drive and some irritability. Evaluation, endocrine consult. We do obtain all of the, the levels of the hormones that the, the adrenal gland does re, uh, release. If you happen to have an afternoon appointment, you might be asked to come in the next morning to have uh, a morning cortisol level obtained. So additional blood work that we don't routinely check for patients that are on standard therapy or not even routinely for patients that are on uh, some of the initial stages of the, of the immunotherapy. Typically, what we will do again is hold the therapy for a bit of time. It may be permanent. Uh, you receive IV steroid replacement with your antibiotic prophylaxis. You may, again, need to be hospitalized, and you may require lifetime uh, supplements. Um, if there is, uh, what we would mention is if there is more long-term damage to the adrenal gland, you may require steroids on an ongoing basis and also what we call stress dosing. So if you're going to undergo a, another procedure or another surgery or you've got other stresses in your life, such as an infection, we might at times during your life need to increase that steroid uh, dosing.